Welcome to a discussion about the uh, music for Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Stephen Trask is a Grammy Award nominated composer, musician, and lyricist who composed the music and lyrics for the musical Hedwig and the Angry Inch and the subsequent film adaptation. Uh, his other credits uh, for film include The Station Agent, In Good Company, American uh, Dreams, and Lovelace. Uh, Stephen, Thanks for joining us. We're really excited to uh, talk to you. Uh, music is such an important part of this uh, project, and we'd love to hear a little bit about the development. Uh, let's talk about, um, you know, adapting your music and songs from the Broadway musical for the big screen. One thing I definitely knew I wanted to do was, you know, the 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 look on the screen was going to be much more vivid and up close than we had on the stage, and this this. The stage costumes, if, when they were up close, they were serious, but there was also a jokey side to them. But in the movie, that was a serious rock band. And I felt like the something I wanted to do in the movie was the music really needed to sound like the music that was made by the people that looked that like that and put together a, a, a really killer band that was centered on, on, um, uh, on Bob Mould as a guitar player, who was one of my idols from Husker Du and then Sugar, who had become a fan of the show and lived down the street from the from the Jane Street Theater, and and you know we hung out pretty regularly. Like he came by, saw the end of the show a lot. You know he saw the show a lot in general. Brought a lot of musicians that I respected there, and then he just hung out. We became really close friends, and I ended up dog sitting for him a lot, which was convenient because it was right near the theater. Um, and then he was he was the centerpiece of the recording band. So I tried to produce it with a slightly less polished sound than the cast album had and, and just a little more, more raw. I know we're going to be talking to Al Alex, but Alex Stairmark, he led us through the process of figuring out how to get the sound of the band coming out on the stage while shooting so that the extras could see what it could, could feel like they were at a concert. People that played the musicians worked really hard to learn their parts and um, worked very closely with, with the actual musicians. We put on these little fake concerts, you know, on the set for the extras. There was a lot of production involved, both on the day and then leading up to it, besides giving all the players their, their parts. You know, we'd pre-record John, do a master take of his vocal. You know, we'd, comp, we'd comp what we thought was the ideal vocal and he would learn that. When he sang live, he was singing, having sort of studied what that master take, and then he would sing about, uh, I don't know, four or five times live and then start lip syncing, because how many times can he sing and then still act a scene? I'm not sure how much of what we actually did playing-wise in the movie actually made it to the film, but um, that drummer, man, he, Michael Aronoff, he was just, he, he hit every drum fill. He made one mistake and it, and it haunts him to this day. One symbol he forgot to hit. This project is very interesting to me because it started out in, in such a simple form, such a very pure form, and then kept expanding from this, you know, kind of cabaret or, you know, personal appearance act and then moving into more of a play and then moving more into the movie. So I'm just curious, what was the feeling of Hedwig for you as the composer, as you were composing these songs and working on this project over those years, what was the feeling of that character that you musically feel was consistent? Like one of the things that Hedwig has that that is sort of like, I mean, some of it just comes from me, but, and, and it's, and inspired by a lot of the same musicians, but a sort of an eclecticism. I listen to a lot of, a lot of different kinds of music. The, songwriters that I idolize listen to a lot of different kinds of music. When Hansel puts his head in the oven early on, it's, you know, Anne Murray and Debbie Boone and David Bowie and Iggy Pop and, and, and you know, Lou Reed. It's not just the punk and glam and avant-garde stuff that, that Hedwig liked. It was an eclectic mix of things. Hedwig name checks like Patti Smith and, and Yoko Ono, but also Aretha Franklin and also uh, Laverne Baker. Hedwig's a student of rock music. You know, and, and even to the point of the, the, the essay that gets Hansel thrown out of university is, is, um, is about the aggressive influence of rock and roll music and uh, or German philosophy and rock and roll music called You Canto is Get What You Want. So, so um, you know, 
it's this is something that 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 character was obsessed with, and I think that the that that the music is drawing, wh wh however it's expressed, um, it's drawing on a lot of different sources at all, all at the same time. And I think that's why trying to translate it to the film, it drew on all those sources, but it had a more the, the the sound is more start to finish cohesive than in the in than in the original uh off Broadway show where it felt like where it where it jumped genres a lot. But we got away with it because we were on stage and we were wearing those costumes. So this was your first feature and and was this the first exposure you had to filmmaking in this in this way where you were a major part of it? Like in a professional sense, absolutely. I, I did a I did a movie musical uh, in college that was a thesis uh, film for Miguel Arteta and um, and it won all sorts of awards like film festival like Berlin Film Festival and I think it got a student academy award it was a similar sort of thing where we actually like had to put a like wrote the songs uh, recorded the songs taught them to the actors performed them on on the screen but it was obviously with for no money and with student equipment and but for what it was, it was celebrated. And 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 I know they, they they had a copy of it on Buffy the Vampire Slayer set, and they watched it a lot, according to Joss Whedon. That's true. So it was it, so, it had its influence. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. So what was the transition like for you to go into this? You know, even though it was an independent film, it was it was definitely a, you know, as you say, a professional major major release film. You know, I think I was, re I, I wasn't, I wasn't a kid. I did the show for a year on, uh, at the Jane Street Theater. And during that time, we did all sorts of appearances and we recorded an album and we tried to launch the show in some other cities and it didn't work because the productions were unwieldy. So by that time, I was just sort of like, it was just sort of like walking into a new room of a house for me and, and with definitely different responsibilities, but it didn't, it didn't feel like, Oh my God! What's this new thing? It was like, oh, this new. Th it was very, just very exciting, new ways of doing the thing. If that makes sense. Completely. I, I do want to bring Alex into the conversation now. So Alex Steiermark has uh, worked as a music supervisor, editor, and producer since 1998 on projects as varied as The Boxer, The Ice Storm, and of course, had begun The Angry Inch. His feature film directorial debut was a musical kick to it, Pray for Rock and Roll. Please welcome Alex Steiermark. Alex, come on board. Hello. <laughs> so I, I think the first thing, you know, music supervisor is one of those titles that I think people think they have an idea of what it's like to supervise music, but I don't think they really know what that that entails on a day-to-day -day basis. So could you two talk about your working relationship and how the composer and music supervisor work together to, to get a cohesive sound and a, and a cohesive feel? Well, I think uh, the, the job of music supervisor is something that is different depending on the film. And, and I think the needs of a movie dictate what that is. And I also think that different people bring different skill sets to it. For me, it's that, I, you know, I, I had studied film, but also studied music my whole life. So I, I always came, came at it for, from the sort of filmmaker side with a sensitivity, I guess, to how music is created. On this particular film, which was a massive, actually a massive endeavor, given the amount of music in the film and the fact that both John and Steven were making their first film. It was a very complex project. And I, I had sort of become known as someone who was good with on-camera, the films with on-camera performances as well. So um, I was brought in by, uh, originally by the producer uh, of the film, Christine Bachon, to meet and talk with Steven and, and, and John about, about the film. Uh, it also helped that uh, I ha had a lot of music production experience. Also, I had seen the show at the Jane Street Theater. So what seemed to be one of the challenges of, of the film was to translate the intensity of what it was like to actually be in the theater and see and feel viscerally the, the music that you felt as an audience member 
sitting in, the, in a theater with live music. And, and that was sort of a guiding principle throughout in how we approach filming the scenes. And, and, and there was, a, as, as Stephen said, there was a, a, a lot of actual on-set music production taking place. Another challenge was that John was both director and uh, star. And so that was a very physically <laughs> demanding task that I don't even think John really realized he was, you know, getting into. And, and so it, it was it was a matter of, of recreating that intensity uh, on, cam- on, on film uh, of the live show. It was also um, having it sort of organizing the filming and the production of the music around physical limitations, also budget. It was not a big budget film. And, um, and we had to be fairly resourceful in, in how we did that, how we approached that. Um, Stephen, when Alex came on board, what was that um, kind of getting to know each other process like? The best part of the getting to know you process was you know in addition to to recording the songs which all happened before the shooting i scored the film i wrote the instrumental score that went throughout the film but i had no equipment i had a four track machine and i had a tv with a vcr i didn't even i don't even got a remote control for my tv you know so like the idea of like pressing play and pressing record and then getting to pick up my instrument with my one microphone like it just it was trying to write music for it i I could write the music, but I couldn't write it really for it. And so I um, actually wrote all of the demo cues at, um, in Alex's office with Alex recording me while I would watch the movie there and sometimes write it there in the room. You know, it's weird to think about now because like I can, you can, you can do almost anything with scoring in a computer, but Alex had what I think at the time was very sophisticated uh, um, computer technology for putting the, for editing the, the music and sticking it into the, into the picture. But looking back and it was very, very primitive sort of technology. Am I right, <laughs> Alex? It, it, like, Certainly by today's it, standards, it was primitive, but we had a lot of fun with it. It was appropriate for, for the circumstances in a way. Um, you had to be pretty inventive. And it was, and it was, I just remember working really, uh, being there after hours, like we were in your office till really late at night. We were, and when it came to the score, there was also a question of, uh, we're, we're getting away from the, the actual songs and everything, but the score is a big part of it actually. And, and even though there's not a lot of it, it plays a, a very important role. and. And uh, we were searching for what that sh- actually, what the thematic material should be. And at a certain point, it, it dawned on us that, that really we should take the, the melodic material from a song that was already in the film and use that as the, as the, the, the theme, the thematic material for the, for the score. So then when we get to the end, it's just this tremendous cathartic release, which I, I think you're not completely aware of as an audience member, but it's there. We're, we're so focused on the song. And, and that was beautiful, actually. The world was just so, was so tight and coherent that it didn't really, it wasn't looking for new material. It wasn't looking for a new song. It wasn't looking for new anything, you know, it just, it wanted to be fleshed out. And, and so yeah, like uh, um, uh, picking up on themes that were already in the songs. Uh, particularly Origin of Love um, and using that in a few spots. Um, I think the flying music is is unique unto itself. Um, and it yes. had to bridge, it had to somehow be score, but like the flying music had to somehow feel like it was in the same musical world as the Angry Inch, which was fading out and the beginning of Wig in a Box, which when the fly music is over, you're there. Basically, it bridges those two worlds and had to feel like it, it was in that space without, and I'd saw it without being, without being a song. And, and like now I'm like, when I, when I score a film, like I actually, like I know how to do that. Like it's a very, <laughs> like it, it comes to, someone give, like gives me a film with a, with a lot of songs in it. I know how to figure out how to do stuff 
that can that can go in between the songs and it's not really that big a deal but but then it felt it felt like a really heavy lift for me um and i guess like 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 the other was like was it what you did a you did that live performance in a spike lee movie right alex sure many of them yeah i love spike lee and i knew i loved all those movies and and so one, I just felt like I was in good hands when we were introduced and when you were like brought into our, our world, but also feeling like knowing that we were doing it right and figuring out that way of mixing live performance and pre-recorded performance and mimicked live performance on the set. Um, like, you know, that, that, was, that was the thing that you taught us how to do. And, and so, well, I, I've always been, especially with this with this kind of music, I, I've always believed pretty strongly that that it's to the extent that it can be done, it's important to 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 do live vocals. Uh, it just it's more believable when you see it coming out of the actor's mouth. Um, uh, we had we had the fortunate situation that that John was both a great actor and a great singer. Those basic ingredients were already there. Initially, um, the producers of the film were wondering why we couldn't just do lip sync, which is what most people were doing, at, at, certainly at the time. And you know, for me, it was just clear that, again, that if we were going to recreate the energy that we felt in the theater, and if we were going to believe that what we were seeing on screen was really happening, uh, we had to do it with live vocals. And so we, that being said, as Stephen mentioned, we, we pre-recorded everything, all the instrumental tracks, we pre-recorded uh, John's vocals, uh, background vocals as well. And um, which, so when we were filming, uh, the musicians were actually miming their instruments, um, but, but John was singing live and we were playing back the, the instrumental tracks in the room over loudspeakers that the actors could hear. We were using real stage microphones, which are pretty good at isolating uh, the voice. And um, and uh, whenever, I'd say it's probably 90% or more live vocals in the film. Um, and we used the pre-recorded vocals uh, because John, you know, it, he, it was just very, very demanding. It, it's, I don't know that John, I'm sure that John didn't realize how, how demanding it would be. Um, it's one thing to go through a show uh, from beginning to end in a couple of hours. It's another thing to spend eight hours in a day singing the same song over and over again without blowing out your, your voice. And so whenever we weren't filming John, we would, then we would be playing back the pre-recorded vocals, which is what, what, the, what the, uh, the extras or the audience and the scenes would be responding to, or um, what, what uh, Steven and the, and the rest of the band would be uh, miming to. The band did play everything note perfect, I would, I yes. would say. And I remember the, the, the drummer had, coming out of the drummer's monitor was the drummer's part loud enough so that for the audience, the sound of the drums seemed to really actually be coming from the drums. And that was something that made it feel more live. Every day it felt like a live, like it felt like a, a, a musical production unto itself. I'm pretty sure that a lot of the extras actually thought they were hearing live music, like entirely live performance. They mentioned that, like they, they were like, wow, you guys play great. <laughs> like, uh -huh, thank you. <laughs> What's one of your favorite moments of musically in the film? Well, here's one that when, you know, with me singing Tommy's version of Wicked Little Town, something really nice happened in that recording. And I remember Bob coming up with an amazing guitar, like did something to the guitar part that just brought it to a new level. But it wasn't just Bob and Tim O'Hare was recording it and he got a great sound and everyone played really well. And something about that recording and then when sung by Michael Pitt, who has that beautiful face, um, not sung by him, but, but he's lip syncing to me singing, like it just, I don't know, it's, a, it's got a, it has a, that record, that one recording has a very special sound to it. I remember that actually when we did that and it, it's very vivid. You were in, you were so in another place. As a performer, you were really feeling the part 
I remember that. It was like you were acting it in the studio. And I think that's why it feels that way. That makes sense because I also had to method act the writing of the song. So singing it was was an extension of that. Like just to write it, I had to go, I had to be somebody else. And so yeah, I I, I remember being in the studio and 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 feeling that go, going and being that other person. And then it just came out really special. How was it determined that you were going to sing that role of, for Tommy? I demanded it. What was there about that 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 made you want to demand it? I knew I could sing it right. And, you know, we had done the cast album with Atlantic Records, and they actually only wanted to do the soundtrack if if we let, like, a one of their big stars be Tommy Gnosis. And it would have been Scott Wheeland, and he's like, you know, he would have sung the shit out of it. But it definitely would have been Scott Wheeland. All, like, like, it wouldn't have been Tommy Gnosis singing. It would have been Scott Wheeland singing. Michael Pitt could have mouthed it, but you'd have known who it was. You know, and I wanted to do it. So I just kind of like, we were very much, when we shopped this movie, we, I, we, had a, we took a lot of meetings and, and gave the pitch of what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. And you know, it was written into the contract that, that, that my band was going to be the band. My band broke up, but they were going to be the band in the movie and on the recordings. And if there were any disagreements about musical elements, the film company could weigh in but that I had the tie-breaking vote over the director and the film studio like these weird like we just demanded like he, John demanded stuff and we demanded stuff, and then we and then New Line was willing to give it to us and Atlantic wasn't and we ended up selling the a, a, Alex sold the, the the soundtrack later to 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 um hybrid records that got lost I think in a card game um by a time. Um, <laughs> And um, we have something to, yeah, like that, to, right? Well, we have to find <laughs> out, yeah. <laughs> but we would go around and give our little pit, our pitch to all these, to all the, to all these film studios, and they would just kind of like look at us, like, who are these people? They're crazy. Like, like you know, we talk about like, like doing this sort of improv John Cassavetes thing, where like there's a lot of not talking and whatever, and 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 sort of like what I'm doing right now, and people and they're. They'd just be like, uh huh, uh huh, like really awkward lunches, and then um, until finally the new line was actually interested. It found the right home. Yeah. So, Alex, going back uh, to the beginning of being brought on to you know kind of create this film music sound, and at the same time ending up selling the soundtrack. I mean. It sounds like you had quite an interesting journey with this film. I'm just wondering, what are some of the pieces along the way that you found particularly personal for you? Well, first of all, I love the show uh, to begin with. So when I was asked to work on the film, uh, I was thrilled. I didn't know John or Stephen at the time. It was very complex and it got, it, you know, it was one of those projects where I got to do uh, everything that I like to do, um, which is frankly, uh, be involved in creating the music as opposed to some of the other roles that music supervisors often play, like clearances and, it's, you know, and licensing and so on. So for, for me, I, I love that aspect of it. I've always preferred that part of it. The greatest thing that came out of it, frankly, was getting to know Stephen <laughs> um, and becoming close friends with him. Stephen, in fact, produced the music for my directorial debut a couple years later, Pray for Rock and Roll, which you mentioned. So if you're lucky, you get to work on a lot of films and meet people, but it's not often that you actually meet someone that you just feel so uh, such a rapport with that, that, that extends beyond just the, the working experience that you have together. So at the same time, it's a great, you know, it's a great film. It's a lot of fun. I like watching it with other people who are discovering it themselves for the first time and, and seeing that it still resonates with people. And it, it's a big success in terms of what we set out to do. We did create a movie that, for lack of a better word, kicks ass musically, you know, and, and, uh, and that's what we wanted to do, you know, and I think it, it does, definitely does that. Kicks ass is definitely, I think, the proper uh, phrase for this film. So was Hedwig a, a hit right away or was it something that you really had to work to keep this project moving? At what point did it start to get a little momentum of its own? 
we always were scraping by, even when we seemed to be a hit. It was always a heavy boulder rolling up a hill. Even on Broadway, like Neil's run was sold out. But when the run started, his first night was sold out, but the second night was half sold. It wasn't until the first show ended and the word got out that he was actually really good. The tickets started selling. It always requires a push. You actually can't let it just go of its own momentum because it, if you don't stay involved, it kind of loses what, whatever's special about it. It shouldn't feel like a piece of commerce. It should feel like a piece of queer punk theater and the queer and the punk parts have to both be there. Like it can't, can't just be queer and it can't just be punk. It's queer punk theater. And, um, and that, that like, you know, John and I are queer punks and like not everybody else is. So we have, we have to keep our fingers in the pie. <laughs> so can you talk about, uh, again, this project started as kind of just a drag performance in, in a very small space and then move to more of a theatrical venue. Can you talk about how Hedwig changed in order to do that? The, the big element that came along was, was, was getting a sort of organizing philosophy for how to present it, which is the show is always happening wherever the show happens to be. And so like when we were at the, when we did it on Broadway, the place that the show was happening was the Belasco Theater. And Hedwig talked about being at the Belasco Theater. And then if there's the question, well, how is this total nobody who's a failure get onto a Broadway stage? Well, then that that becomes part of the that becomes part of the story that she, you know, in this in that case, a show had closed, um, a show had closed on opening night. Um, Hurt Locker, the musical, which is a name that Michael made up. Um, and, uh, and their set was still there and, and, and Hedwig gives a blow job to the guy that, that runs the theater is actually the guy that runs the whole Schubert organization. And he gave her the theater for justice one night. Um, but like some of it was, was just like learning new ways to kind of do the same thing. Like when we first did it at Fez under Tan Cafe and we had recordings of Tommy Gnosis off stage like the, like we didn't have a budget so john came over to my house and we hooked a microphone up to um a guitar amp with reverb so he could sound like he was in a stadium and then i put that on one channel of a four track and then on the other channels i recorded little snippets of crowd noise from the concert for bangladesh on tracks two three and four and they were never really long enough to keep going so i would just keep Cross fading from two to three to four to two to three to four to two to three to four, so that mm -hmm. Tommy could be talking and saying his stuff, and the crowd could be responding. It was a makeshift version of what we ended up doing, but it was that philosophy of being where you are that we found was the thing that worked. Does that answer your question? Very much so, and and it's not the answer I would have expected. So thank you very much. You mentioned earlier that you know you were both queer and both punk and all that, and and obviously you had your music sensibility and your music side of the story and John was more the performer and writer perhaps, uh, you know, but what do you see as the thing that you and John brought to this that that gave it the cohesiveness and that gave it the, the yin and the yang, so to speak? I kind of write half the words that come out of Hedwig's mouth and John writes the other words that come out of Hedwig's mouth, but it all has to sound like Hedwig. So, we had to be very much of one mind. And so a lot of a lot of the work, it came out of long conversations, like just long days and nights just spent talking about the various issues that related to the show and really getting into dualities and 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 binaries and breaking those open and, and, and talking, you know, looking at a lot of philosophy and religious philosophy and all of this stuff and just long conversations so that when you went to write, it wasn't necessarily that you went to write with an instruction for what was going to happen in the story, but you were writing from the perspective of coming out of these conversations where, where the two of us were just engaged in this thing. What we ended up 
writing was just us talking to each other, talking to each other in a way that we thought would entertain our friends. Like in the back of our mind, it, might, it was someday going to be something else. But, but I think for me, and I'm pretty sure for John, like the most immediate thing was we're writing to each other and we're going to show it to our friends who know us. And, and, and I think that's why it has that, that feeling of yin and yang, like totally come together. Alex, you, you observed them working together and, and observed the making of the film. What are the different pieces that they each bring to the, uh, to the mix, so to speak? I knew a lot about the, creative, the, the collaborative process, how the show had been created uh, even before I met them. And, and I uh, knew that it would be super stressful <laughs> for both of them. And so uh, because it was their first film, because film is usually a director's medium, you know, and here, here we had a situation where we had two creative partners who were both equally important to the success of the show and, and, and of, the, of the concept. In this case, also Stephen was a creative collaborator in, in the making of the film, and so that was also different. Usually, the the, the music creator is not in that position, you know. So I, I was always very mindful. I was always trying to be respectful of both John and Stephen's equal partnership in the creation of Hedwig. The idea of Hedwig. Part of my role, besides all the other things we talked about, was sort of navigating the the, cre the the creative process that each one of them would have to go through to create the movie, you know, so that each of them could do what they had to do. You know, honestly, I spent a lot of time just trying to understand where each of them was coming from so that that we could guide the 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 from the musical part of it, the, 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 that process forward. You know, I, I, I think it's a testament to their relationship. They made the film and then they went on and did the Broadway show. You know, they have, this is a very special entity, the, the John and Stephen and, and Hedwig, this world that they've created. One of the things that was different about the movie was that our spheres stopped happening in the same space. Recording all the music for the film and then turning it into an album and then recording the score. It was this entirely other production that had to fit with the film, but they were happening in different spaces and John and I really didn't like see each other. Whereas when you're doing it on stage, it was me and John and Peter Askin and Miriam and I would, and I would have a piano and a guitar and we would just be sitting around a table and just performing it there, you know, and then you get onto the stage and the band is there and, and you're all working together in the same room. But we kind of like, we kind of went off into our own spheres. And it's true with a, any musical film, it's actually more than one production. You have the film production, but before all of that happens, you have, a, you, have you know, maybe a couple of months of a music production, you, you're rehearsing First, the band that you have to pre-record and John, the, who was singing. Then you have to rehearse the actors who are going to be in, in the film. And all this has to happen even before you can roll film. And then afterwards, the film is done. And then we did go and do the, all the album mixes, which was like a, a, you know, a whole other production. There were a lot of moments where the, the, what was happening in the music sphere was separate from what was happening in, in, in the film. What's your favorite moment in the film or some of your favorite sh memories from the shoot? One, I loved doing the improv improvisational scenes that got cut, but there were all sorts of things that we did that sometimes it's ended up being like an overhead shot in the hotel room. Uh, Therese had this great thing where we, in addition to touring around the same fish restaurant, her idea was that we were in the same hotel, motel chain throughout the tour. So the four walls were always the same four walls. But as the tour went on, we had less and less money. Our room kept getting smaller. So at the beginning of the tour, we're in a kind of spacious room and we're all kind of spread out. And at the end of the tour, the room is the width of the bed. And then there's just like a little place to stand that's just wide enough to open the door to get in. So it's the same decor that just kept getting closer and closer. My memory of it is that it was a blur. It was uh, a very tight schedule and there was so much to do. It was nonstop activity from 
morning to night. A lot of it was, to be honest, was also getting John to pace himself so that he wouldn't burn out because he would throw himself into it. And, and again, he was directing. So, you know, he was looking at the monitor in costume, you know, and then having to run out and, and sing and perform. To be honest, a little concern, you know, he, did, he had to make it to the end. And so, so a lot of it was just getting him to not use up all his energy in, in, in one moment because he had a lot to do. Just filming Midnight Radio was pretty intense, you know. It was a, a, it was a puzzle, actually, of how to put it together. I still kind of feel like this jolt in, when I see that in the film, it's, especially when we cut to Miriam, you know, falling back and the whole, the whole thing. With Alex just mentioning, like, like, getting John to pace himself and how much work he's doing. On the visual side, like, Therese was, like, of all the people on the visual side, she was the most experienced. But I think Alex probably brought the, the most film experience of anybody to this movie. You know, I could feel that when we first started working together. And it was very important for me, actually, Alex, to, to, to either impress you or to get your approval. But like, <laughs> like that sense of Alex has done this, he knows what this is, like, I felt, felt in very good hands and bringing you in, into the world, like it felt right to bring you into the in, into there. I'm glad you brought me into it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Stephen, Alex, I want to thank you both for this conversation. Um, it's really great to uh, talk about your uh, collaboration on this film with the music. And it's also great to see that uh, you've each found a friend. So congratulations and thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for... Thanks for asking me to be a part of it. Sorry you were uh, up at four in the morning, but I don't think this is the first time. So. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the good old days, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs>